Hi, I'm Nate Seberg, and this is One Day Ahead. Welcome to One Day Ahead, Lord of the Flies, Chapter 1. In this web series for teachers and students staying a day ahead of the class, I take you through a summary and analysis of William Golding's 1954 classic tale of romping childhood adventure and the murderous capacity for evil that lurks in the heart of us all. Good times. These videos are going to take you chapter by chapter through a detailed plot summary followed by analysis of key quotes. If you're teaching this material, check out my Lord of the Flies unit. It's got everything you need. Link below. As ever, these are not spoiler-free videos. Videos. If you would like to experience the story without spoilers, I suggest you read it. But if not, well then grab your specs and sucks to your ass more, because it's time to dive into chapter one, The Sound of the Shell. So this book begins with some intentional disorientation for the reader. It's meant to mirror the disorientation felt by the characters. They've just been in a plane crash, but critically, we don't get those pages. Instead, we start with the kid wandering around a crash site, which is referred to for the first of many times as a long scar. This framing introduces one possible reading of the entire book, the idea that nature undisturbed is pristine and that humanity mars that perfection and introduces evil to paradise. And we, well, they are that evil. Think Adam and Eve in Original Sin. Anyway, right away we meet Ralph, the boy with the fair hair, and another we will learn to call Piggy, who is described as fat seven times in the first two pages. I like that Golding, the author, he got to six and was like, Meh, one more. We never do learn Piggy's real name, but we can tell right away that he is needy, but also that he's like probably the smartest kid on the island. Piggy attaches himself to Ralph, who at 12 and a few months has lost the prominent tummy of childhood and is not yet old enough for adolescence to have made him awkward. As they pick through the jungle, Piggy announces proudly that he has asthma, which Ralph brilliantly rebrands as Asmar. Comic gold. Piggy also shows Ralph his thick eyeglasses he calls his specs. Having established the two things that make him special, Piggy abruptly stops and says, them fruit, I expect. He put on his glasses, waded away from Ralph, and crouched down among the tangled foliage. Yeah. Piggy's... Piggy's taking a dump. So, not a great first showing from my guy Piggy. Rather than hanging around to listen to this, Ralph stole away through the branches. In a few seconds, the fat boy's grunts were behind him. Oh, Piggy. After a few minutes, they reach a protected lagoon where the boys swim. Well, Ralph swims while Piggy wades, citing his asthma. To which Ralph replies with, by far, the most quoted line of the book. Say it with me now. Sucks to your asthma. We also learn that Ralph's dad is in the Navy. Oh, and that while they were in the air, Piggy heard that an atomic bomb was dropped wherever they were going. And like, I don't know, a million people are dead. The upshot is this, though. No one is left alive at wherever they were going to tell anyone else that they didn't make it. So no rescue is coming. Then Piggy returns to the jungle to poop some more. Piggy! In the lagoon, the boys find a conch shell, and Piggy suggests Ralph blow it to call the other survivors. The shell booms across the island. Ugh. Sorry, beast. You're okay. Ah! Stay up. This is a... Come on now. Come on, guy. Ooh. The shell booms across the island and they wait. The first to appear is a boy of perhaps six, sturdy and fair, his clothes torn, his face covered with a sticky mess of fruit. His trousers had been lowered for an obvious purpose and had only and had only been pulled back halfway. This is the third instance where a kid is just taking a crap in the jungle. Guys, what is happening? We've been here six minutes. Over time, boys, and they are all boys. In fact, there's not a female character anywhere in this book, assemble. Let's meet the rest of our cast, shall we? We already got Ralph and Piggy, but here we meet Jack Marydu. You'll want to keep an eye on him. Jack is the head of a choir of boys, literally like a singing choir. We meet the twins, Sam and Eric, and Roger, who's described as a slight furtive boy whom no one knew, who kept to himself with an inner intensity of avoidance and secrecy. And finally, Simon, a small, sensitive, kind-hearted boy with something medical going on because he faints dead away during the meeting. 
we find out that this has happened before. There's a bunch of other kids, but like these are the ones for us. The assembly votes Ralph chief over Jack, but then Ralph offers him an olive branch by letting him keep the choir as his. Jack rechristens the choir as his hunters and commits to finding meat for the survivors. The next order of business, recon. Ralph chooses himself, Jack and the slightly fainty Simon to ascend the only mountain on the island to get a look around. Jack accepts this invitation by pulling out a sizable sheath knife and clouding it into a trunk. And thus, Jack begins his long and proud tradition of randomly stabbing stuff. The trip to the island's central mountain is attended by a very heavy bromance between the three characters, especially Jack and Ralph. After a brief stop to push a huge rock down a hill, they finally reach the top where they discover that yes, it is an island and yes, they are alone. Rather than being overcome by dread, they love it. No adults, adventure, ownership by default. Eyes shining, mouth open, triumphant, they savored the right of domination. They were lifted up, were friends. On the trip back, the trio comes across a piglet caught in the jungle vines, which the boys call creepers. It's frantic, squealing, writhing. The boys rush the pig and Jack draws his knife and raises it to kill. But then comes a pause, which was only long enough for them to understand what an enormity the downward stroke would be. In this moment, the piglet escapes. They all know why Jack paused. Because of the enormity of the knife descending and cutting into living flesh. Because of the unbearable blood. But Jack offers a lame excuse. I was choosing a place. Next time, he snatched his knife out of the sheath and slammed it into a tree trunk. Next time, there would be no mercy. So between the rock rolling, the piglet, and the stabbing stuff, I will say this for Golding, he is not afraid of a little light foreshadowing. There will be no mercy for the next pig. Guys, there is a character on the island named Piggy. It is not subtle. And that is chapter one. So each chapter, we're gonna explore the themes and characters by going just a step or two beyond what's on the page. This is Deep Dive Quotes. Our first quote today is pretty innocuous. The fair boy stopped and jerked his stockings with an automatic gesture that made the jungle seem for a moment like the home counties. So that's not much, but it does speak to the central question of the whole book that is established straight away. And the plainest way I can say it is this, according to Golding, according to this book, the whole point, here it is, the darkness is in us. So this is gonna get like a little out there, but here it goes. See, there was some debate, and I suppose there still is, as to the origin of fundamental evil. Like everyone can agree that there is darkness in the world because it's a mess and we suck. There's this Latin phrase from a Roman playwright. I don't know Latin, I feel I need to say that, but it's this, homo homini lupus. Man is a wolf to man. We are cruel savage, sadistic, and full of malice and brutality. But where does that darkness spring from? Are we born good and then corrupted by an evil world? Or do we bring that darkness with us when we are born? Is it innate to who we are? Are we the darkness? And if so, does that mean we must overcome ourselves by choosing civilization as the antidote to our chaos? That is the foundational question this book explores. And I'll say this, like definitely answers. And in that way, it's satisfying because Golding didn't dodge this this question or like turn it back on us with a you decide what it means kind of ending. No, this text is a persistent, relentless downward march to a place where the conclusion that man is born evil is inescapable. And one look at Golding's biography and you will understand why. Sir William Gerald Golding, born 1911, attended Oxford, that's in England, and eventually became a high school teacher for, I assume, the money and the women. But before that, he spent five years in Her Majesty's Royal Navy. He saw significant action during World War II, was present for D-Day, and like so many of his generation, lost his faith in humanity. In the war, he had discovered what one man could do to another. He had seen real atrocities, but critically, and to his horror, those violations of humanity, they had not been committed, as novels had taught him to expect, by the headhunters of New Guinea or some primitive tribe in the Amazon. They were done skillfully, coldly, by educated men, doctors, lawyers, by men with a tradition of civilization behind them. Following his service, Golding would later reflect that man produces evil as a bee produces honey. So he was not in a real good place. Informed by that background, Golding set out to pen a novel that would highlight the primacy of our innate brutality, but also show that we can and must choose civilization and thus fight our natural inner darkness. Golding believed that we were bad and that we must fight and fight again and keep fighting, for only then can evil be kept at bay. 
though never quite eradicated. Albus, mother Dumbledore. And that's what's going on here with the socks. These reminders of the civilization from whence they came are a stand-in for the civilized world they knew. When Ralph does something as simple as pulling up his socks, he connects briefly with that past civilized life, and thus the jungle, the embodiment of unknowable, savage danger, it recedes. Same thing later on, when the heat seemed to increase until it became a threat in weight and the lagoon attacked them with blinding effulgence. What does Ralph do? He puts on more clothes, which like doesn't make sense, but he discovered that to put on a gray shirt once more was strangely pleasing. And take a look at the first time they mentioned the beast. Here it's called a creature. Within the diamond haze of the beach, something dark was fumbling along. Ralph saw it first and watched till the intentness of his gaze drew all eyes that way. Then the creature stepped from the mirage onto clear sand and they saw that the darkness was not all shadow, but mostly clothing. The creature was a party of boys. Guys, it's them. The darkness, the fear, the other, the creature, the evil, the beast. It is born out of and lives in them. Let's talk about why everyone's pooping. So answering that question requires we figure out where we are. Luckily, we have some clues. On page 20, when Simon fates dead away at the meeting, Jack dismisses this medical emergency, saying he's always throwing a faint. He did it in Gib, in Addis, and at Mattis over the Precentor. I, I think I'm saying that right. I don't know. I could look it up. I'm not gonna. So Mattis is morning prayer and Precentor is the director of a choir. So like not geographically beneficial, but the first one, Gib, well, if they left England, they're British, if that's not obvious, then a logical stop would be Gibraltar. Gibraltar is a territory in what would otherwise be Spain that the British have held onto for navally strategic reasons that if this map doesn't make immediately clear, I, I just can't help you. After the mention of Jib, we get Addis, as in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. So Gibraltar, then refueling in Addis, and then where? Well, if you connect the dots, the next country you'll hit, besides Somalia, is the British Commonwealth of Australia. It's a reasonable bet that that is where they are going, meaning two things. One, they crashed on an island in the Indian Ocean, and two, all of the Aussies, and I'm assuming their global supply of kangaroos, are dead. So the Indian Ocean is vast, it's 25 million square miles. And while maps would have you think it's empty, it's actually home to over 1,500 islands. So getting back to our question, what would they have been eating? Well, islands in this latitude would likely include fruits like bananas, longan, long, 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 and guava, all of which are high in three things, water, sugar, and fiber, specifically a type of fiber known as pectin. And in 2014, a groundbreaking study out of China explored the laxative properties of pectin. They found soluble dietary fiber use, in this case pectin, accelerates colon transit time and alleviates clinical symptoms in patients with slow transit constipation. In other words, pectin makes you poop. So there you have it. They're in the Indian Ocean, they're eating a lot of fruit, and a lot of fruit means a lot of poop. Humans are gross. And that's chapter one. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like, check out my teaching unit and my other stuff. Next week, we turn to chapter two, where the kids make a fire, the bromance deepens, and the boys, they they kill someone. All that and more next time on One Day Ahead.